All right, so I want to welcome everybody. This is our GPUG uh, for June 2021. It's first look at Event Sauce 1.0 live, excellent, uh, with Bo Simonson. So thanks everybody for coming out. Just a little bit about our agenda. So I'm going to do a welcome like this, uh, and then we're going to do some introductions. Uh, I'm going to talk and give thanks to our sponsors that helped make this possible. Uh, then Bo will do his live event sauce demonstration, I guess is what we're going to call it. And, uh, and then if you, if you hang out, there will be a raffle. We're giving away a free one-year license to any JetBrains IDE, courtesy of one of our sponsors, JetBrains. Okay, so welcome. Thanks. Our speaker tonight is Bo, Bo Simonson, and he is a domain-driven domain -driven design enthusiast an event sourcing fan, an event storming dabbler. I'm actually kind of excited to figure out what that means. Um, and, and a little bit of an inconsistent live streamer. So uh, thank you for coming out and, and doing this for us uh, as well. A little bit about our sponsors. So I just want to thank Vehicle. Vehicle has been a longtime sponsor of the GPUG. Uh, they make things happen for us, give me the time to work on the GPUG. So thank you for uh, allowing that to happen and being a sponsor of the GPUG. Also, I want to thank our sponsors, Givelify. Givelify gives us uh, this Zoom link so that we can record our meetups, post them to meetups at home, and keep things under control. So thank you, Givelify, for sponsoring that. They've been doing this for, I think, over a year now. So yeah, thank you very much. It's been uh, really instrumental in helping us take this online. So thank you very much. All right, on with the show. I'm going to stop my share and then I'm going to hand things off to Bo. And I believe, Bo, you want this to be um, somewhat interactive, right? Definitely. I'd love to uh, have this be interactive if possible. So by all means, if anyone has a question as you're going, um, I'm not sure the best way to moderate it, if it's to use the little emotes to raise your hand or say a message in chat and have Colin bring it up or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, if it's, we could even try just, you know, unmuting yourself if you want to and say, hey, what about blah, blah, blah. Um, as long as that doesn't get too out of hand, I think that will probably even work as well. But yeah, I, I want this to be something that's fun and engaging. And um, it's a topic that I think people probably usually have a lot of questions about. Um, so the, the amount of actual presentation is pretty minimal. Um, so your questions aren't going to be answered later, <laughs> probably, um, if you have questions along the way. All right. Thanks, Bill. All right. Over to you. All right. So um, today we're going to be talking about event sourcing. And specifically, we're going to be taking a look at a uh, library called Event Sauce. Um, event Sauce is one of the ways that you can get into event sourcing in PHP relatively easily, whether you're using you know, Laravel or Symfony or whatever, um, if you just want to add event sourcing into your application, event sauce is a reasonably easy way to get started. All right, so a little bit about me. Um, I started programming back in 2007, at least professionally. Um, I worked at an internet service provider, and I think my very first bit of coding was uh, shell code. And I consider that code, and I very much considered it programming back then. Um, and I did some amazing things that nobody should ever do with shell code, or at least tried to. I think the first real programming I did was trying to hack guestbook.pl. Uh, does anyone remember guestbook.pl? No? Yeah. It's a, it's a really awesome uh, Perl, library, uh, Perl script from back in the day if you wanted a guestbook on your web page. Because at one point, having a guestbook on your web page was really important. Fast forward to about 2007, um, I kind of worked my way pretty deep into Perl, um, but I also started to work in some other languages, including Java. And during a spring training uh, for the spring framework, I heard uh, the trainer mentioned something that sort of didn't make sense to me at first. I'm like, he used a very specific word and the word was a repository. And the context that he used it in was like, Oh, so-and-so would probably say to use a repository instead of a whatever else 
uh, was normal. So I was curious what he was talking about. And so that was my first introduction to the Domain Driven Design book by Eric Evans. Uh, how many people are, Eric, how many people have, have at least been aware of this book? A couple, a couple of people? Awesome. Yeah, so it's a really dense book and I absolutely loved it. I learned a lot from it. Uh, the problem was that I was working in environments where it didn't really make sense to be doing event or to be doing uh, domain driven design. Um, and one of the common things I see with people is they get stuck, uh, especially developers get stuck in the, the tactical patterns, um, you know, doing things like DTOs and repositories. And they, they look at the like the code bits. Um, and it turns out that a good chunk of domain driven design is actually not the code bits. Um, it's actually more about communication than trying to code things up. Um, and one of the common phrases you'll see from people in domain-driven design um, circles, like if you ask them a very specific question, they'll say, well, you know, the implementation isn't important, or it depends, like it depends is like the big one that everyone asks, like, well, how would you do this? Well, it depends. Well, that's not super useful, um, especially if you're looking at these patterns from the level that this book was actually uh, showing them in. So it took me about maybe seven years of playing with um, domain driven design just from the context of the blue book. Um, the, the first book is uh, oftentimes referred to as the blue book uh, because the second one is referred to as the red book. Um, I found this um, had been out and one of my friends started to do a dev book club online. And so we were gonna read through implementing domain driven design because we'd both done the, the blue book uh, but neither was it done the red book and the red book was very it was challenging in a different way um, it was very it kind of gave us all gave me what i was hoping for which was a little more real world um, pragmatic pragmatic examples of how to do ddd uh, the problem was that it was very specific <laughs> so um, as it turned out it wasn't always super easy to understand what was going on and it was like a, a zoomed in view of part of the code, uh, but you can see the whole code. So it was really difficult. It wasn't until like two years later that I found out the, the source code for the whole project in the book uh, was actually on GitHub. <laughs> so uh, that suddenly made the whole book a lot easier to revisit and kind of look into some like the whole implementation for some of these things. And before I had gone into the, um, the Red Book, I hadn't really contemplated, I hadn't really understood um, domain events. Um, they seemed very obscure and unimportant, kind of hand wavy, like what do they even mean? What do they do? What are they for? Um, but by the end of domain implementing domain driven design, I realized that I'd missed something major, that the domain events were actually very important um, because they communicate what's happened. Um, and so the final, um, sort of like the final iteration in this book, um, the, the, whole art, or the whole chapter was on event sourcing um, because events had become so important to this sample application that was being built up that became very clear to the, the original author that, hey, we need to do event sourcing for this because it's going to give us certain benefits. So event sourcing at its simplest is an idea that everything that happens in the system that, that is business critical, that actually means something, um, anything that really changes the, the application state gets saved. So you end up with a stream of events that represent everything that was, was important that happened in your application from the beginning of time. And in theory, that's all you need. Like if you had nothing else persisted in like a MySQL database or a MongoDB or whatever, you, you would be fine because you have everything that is important in your application stored in this stream of events. Um, if this sounds really odd, there's a couple of relatively well-known use cases for this same sort of technology. One of them is an accounting. How many people have ever tried to work with an accounting system, especially like a double entry accounting system? Okay, cool. 
see a couple, couple, couple of raised thumbs, couple of raised hands. The, the best way to describe event sourcing in the context of accounting is that you don't really have a DB field with a specific accounts balance. Right, there, there is no record with Bo's social security numbers, the primary key um, with, you know, he has $100 to his name. That doesn't exist. That's not, not actually a thing. What instead happens are a bunch of journal entries and the journal entries have meanings. So for example, I might deposit $100 into a brand new account when I open it. This could be represented as account opened as an event. This is a discrete thing that happened. It has a time when it happened. It has other contexts like whose account, what account number, et cetera, um, and also the dollar amount. So I opened it with $100. You can't, well, let's say the business rules say you can't open an account unless you have money to put into it. And that's actually usually the case at a bank. You can't just say, I'm going to open a new checking account. Usually there's some sort of opening balance. You have to deposit at least $5 or whatever. If I come back and deposit $150, like say a week later, um, I'm going to get another event in the transaction log that is funds deposited. I have deposited an, an additional $150. So I know that my balance is $250 now. The bank knows this, but it's not, it's not persisted anywhere. It is the calculation of all of the events that have happened on my account to that point. If I then take $200 out, I write a check or whatever, now my balance is $50. And you can get that by replaying the events that have happened to the account since the account was opened. If I try to get more money <laughs> than I have, if I withdraw $75, and let's say the system allows that to happen as banks used to allow. I don't know if they still do because they got in trouble for it. Um, but you know, I'm going to withdraw $75. I only had 50. So it's actually going to record that the funds are withdrawn. It's going to be able to calculate my balance as negative $25, but it's also going to record an additional event that my account was overdrawn. So these are the things that sort of stack up and this is sort of how an event source system works. It keeps track of everything that happens to an entity as discrete events, as opposed to storing the current state of the object. So after account opened, there is no account that has a balance of $100 and then a balance of $250. This is what we're all used to. Um, usually you have a database that keeps track of whatever the current state of affairs is and you don't really have this notion of here's all of the history that happened leading up to it. The other use case for this same sort of um, storage system is actually the basis for many relational database management systems. Uh, for example, uh, MySQL. MySQL has a binary log and it's doing the same thing. The binary log keeps track of all statements that would have or should have, or would have or could have updated the data. And so the reason they do this is so that um, you can have a, a log of a, a log that you know is true, so that if your database crashes, you can rebuild it from scratch. Um, you don't have to have the original files and all the right table structure and all of that, because that comes, that can be rebuilt by replaying every single statement that had been done since the database was created. Um, one of the interesting things on here is the little parentheses bit where it says, for example, the delete which matched no rows. So it's actually, that's sort of uh, another part of the event sourcing thing. If something happened or something should have happened or an action happened, but nothing came of it, we still want that tracked. So even though we did a delete statement that didn't actually delete anything, the, the record is going to show that we tried to delete it. Um, I don't know the, the underlying details where it says unless row-based logging is used. I, don't try not to get too bogged down into the details of this because I'm not going to go into MySQL's binary log. Just the general idea that it's doing the same sort of thing. Behind the scenes, it is keeping track of everything that someone tries to do with a set of data.
Yes. I, I have a question. Sure. Um, so like this, this thing from the, from the bin log kind of like supports, but I was thinking in the sense that like the events that, that, mm -hmm. that I get fired out of this event sourcing are kind of like, as you said, like events that change the state. So they mm -hmm. would be like creates updates, deletes, those sorts of things. If we're yeah. thinking about CRUD actions, but no reads. I was curious when you showed the, the account overdrawn event on mm -hmm. the ledger, what like it, was it maybe like, was that like a simplification? Was there something there or was that, why, why would that be a part of the event that gets thrown? So uh, it's interesting that you ask it that way because it's possible that event isn't important for the persistence layer, but within the system, it would be important to know that, hey, this account was overdrawn so that it could send an email alert, it could, you know, start start a countdown to start charging the user overdraft fees, that sort of thing. So it would sort of depend on your specific application, whether or not that would be something that is like a meaningful domain event for that specific entity, or if it's a, people call them integration events, where it's more notification to anything else that's listening that this thing happened. So it can get a little fuzzy sometimes um, when, when you're looking at events as to which ones are things that are important to that object versus things that may be emitted because something happened so that like, they're listening to. So like, for instance, like even here in the this explanation saying like a delete that matched no rows, it was still something that, that maybe some things that are consuming the bin log might be interested in knowing about delete yep. saving, who's exactly. sending them those sorts of things. Yep. Interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah, so we'll get into that um, a little bit. Um, but yeah, that is something that is pretty nuanced and a lot of people have different opinions on it. Uh, but that's a good, th that's a good thing to catch. So it depends. <laughs> yeah, it depends. <laughs> All right, thanks. Yep. So uh, one of the concepts that you'll see talked about alongside event sourcing a lot of times is CQRS. I'm not gonna talk about this a whole lot, but we're gonna talk about it from a high level. Um, event sauce specifically avoids anything around CQRS. You can use some of these concepts with it, but it just focuses on event sourcing. Uh, CQRS stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation. And for our general purposes, when I create a model using like Eloquent or uh, a basic uh, doctrine model or something like that, you have a model and you write changes to it and you can read from it. And that model is then persisted to a database. So writes and update or updates and select statements. This was always how I understood models to work. And whenever I learned about CQRS and saw people talking about that. Whenever you hear about read models um, and CQRS, I never really understood this concept of why would you have all your reads coming from a completely different model? Uh, why would you have this separation of like, I can't ever read from the model. I always have to read from a read model. Um, it's very fuzzy. And I never really got it. And a lot of the problem was because I didn't understand how these two things could ever work. Because how, like, if I can't write to the read model, how, how does it ever get data? <laughs> if, I can't, if I can't read from the model, then how do I get the data? Um, and as it turns out, uh, one of the things that uh, event sourcing really does is fills in this blank. Right, so events get uh, events get emitted from the model, and then those events can be sent to a projector, which is something that we'll probably talk about a little bit later. The projector consumes those events and writes to the read model. So if we had a customer balance read model, we would be listening for the events coming from the account model. And every time the account, you know, if we do the account opened, that would be an insert statement with a, for that account ID with a balance of $100. When we see the funds deposited, we'd see an update statement 
uh, we'd be able to generate an update statement for that account ID and add it to whatever value was previously there. When it's overdrawn, like we would probably skip that event, uh, like what, what Colin was asking before, we don't really matter, we don't, we don't really care about that. Uh, we would only be looking at the things that are dealing specifically with the balance um, because that's all that this read model really cares about. It just wants to have a really quick way to look up for this account, what is its balance? So this gives you a way to have a model that you only ever write to. So you only ever do things like deposit account or deposit funds, deposit funds, deposit funds. You never read from it, but when you need to show somebody their balance, you go to the read model to get the, um, the amount of money for that account through the read model. We aren't going to be dealing with this <laughs> at all uh, because uh, event sauce really deals with just this top bit, just the model to the events. And it turns out that CQRS isn't how you have to deal with anything related to event sourcing. Um, you can actually reconstitute the model by reading in the events that are relevant and then doing stuff with the model based on that. So CQRS comes up a lot. You'll see that a lot. You'll even see it in the event sauce documentation, um, but it's a very specific thing and it really feels pretty heavy anytime I've ever tried to use it. So I, I would love to try doing something that is really just event sourced, but doesn't really do the whole CQRS stuff. We might still use projectors and create read models, but we aren't going to stick to the only create with the model or only send commands to a model and only ever read from the read model. So that brings us to event sauce. Uh, event sauce, if you want to read the marketing information, um, it's a pragmatic event sourcing library for PHP uh, with a focus on developer experience. So it's very, um, the, the author of the, the library is very focused on just making event sourcing simple and easy to use and not forcing you to buy into a whole framework. Um, there's a couple of other frameworks that I've used in the past or looked at, including Proof, um, Proof Secure, uh, Proof, I don't remember what the whole thing is called, uh, but P-R-O-O-P-H. Um, I was a early user of Broadway. I'm not really sure how, how active Broadway is right now. But yeah, this specific library is just focusing on event sourcing. So that's what we're gonna take a look at today. I did mention event storming, and this is something that I'd really like to uh, go into more detail at one point. I think the, uh, the original creators of event storming were very against doing anything <laughs> online. Event storming was an in-person workshop experience, uh, but I recently saw they were giving remote event storming lessons. <laughs> so I think the uh, pandemic life sort of gave them an alternate way to uh, experience uh, their creation. And event storming, uh, often it's easy for me, for example, to get confused when I'm saying things because I will say event storming when I mean event sourcing, or I'll say event sourcing when I mean event storming. Um, and what events Storming is, is a way to keep track of how events flow through the system. And it's a way to understand how the system is actually working um, by way of events. Uh, there's much more than just events and event storming, uh, but we're probably only going to have time to really focus on those because those are the things that are super important. So we'll just see what that's like. But again, you have to do it in a group, usually. Um, I'm usually a solo dev, so I end up doing a lot of event storming on my own. But yeah, the, we're going to take a look at what that looks like anyway. All right, so let's get rid of hello. And we're going to drop dive into Miro. Uh, so Miro is a tool that I use for uh, doing my own event storming sessions for myself. And so we're going to do that real quick just to sort of get a feel for what it is that event storming is and sort of how it works. So I kind of had to come up with some sort of contrived thing 
that we're going to build. And so I'm going to build a um, tiny inventory management system. And one of the cool things is you can create your own templates. So I'm going to use my event storming legend template, which just has a couple of things that are like pre-built into it. Let's use that. OK. The legend is useful for people who aren't necessarily familiar with the terminology. So I always include this, um, but I usually pull, when I copy things, I copy it from the ones that don't have names because I hate you know, putting the names in or having to delete the names. Uh, so each of the things, each of the colors has a meaning. Uh, events are the ones that we're mostly going to be focused on. Events represent things that happened in the system. So we've recorded it as having actually happened. Uh, commands are intent. These are things that we intend to do. Generally, you intend to do something, and then the thing happens, um, unless there's an exception thrown <laughs> in between. Um, so usually, the, the, this is kind of laid out in the format of what actually happens. The other thing is uh, read model. Read model is, in this sense, more what do I need to know in order to, or what do I or the um, system in place need to know in order to make the decision. So when an event comes, in this case, and an event comes in, the automated system that deals with that event, what does it have to know? So like maybe there is a, a bonus system and so the policy looks to see um, anytime someone buys something, um, it needs to know whether or not the person who bought it is signed up for the loyalty club. If they are, then it can issue a command. So that's what these things are for. They're supposed to give you information that are supposed to visually show what information it needs in order to make something happen. Policies are kind of hard to describe. Um, either process managers um, or I think that's probably the best thing. They're things that consume events and then cause stuff to happen. So these are automation points. Anytime this happens, I'm going to decide to do this command. Um, and then aggregates are sort of like your models. It's like uh, for, for the account tracking system, the aggregate might be account where it's for all intents and purposes, an account class that has an ID that the command is being executed on. And then external systems would be things like APIs or like if you're sending an email or sending a notification broadcast, the external system there could be notifications or it could be email or it could be uh, something more specific if you need it to be. If you're integrating with GitHub, it could actually just say GitHub, um, whatever it is. In that case, you're sending the command, which is probably going to be an API call to GitHub, and then expecting something to happen from it. So we're going to use this as a starting point. And so I'm going to say that inventory system has, it's going to be as, as simple as we can make it without making it too simple. So there will be stock in our inventory, and we are going to have a a SKU, or maybe not a SKU, maybe we'll just call it an ID, um, that it, or the product ID that represents a specific thing um, that we have for sale, like uh, PHP elephants, say. So the first thing that we're going to do is we, are, we, we don't have the item in our inventory until we've actually received it in stock. So we're going to add an event of stock received, things that can happen to the stock after it's received is stock can be sold. So this is when stuff comes back out. So let's just do that for now and see how that goes. And then we're going to build another part of the system that will be the order system that orders the parts, like that actually orders stuff from our inventory. So we'll do this one as order placed. Oh. All right, 
So these are sort of like some, some basic level events that talk about things that actually happen in the system. We aren't talking about color, we aren't talking about weight of the items or any of that. Right now, we're just talking about what is in the inventory. So we know that we have received a certain amount of, of items, and then we are going to sell a certain amount of items. And that will change the amount of those items that we have in our inventory. So we're going to add our aggregate routes now. And I'm kind of skipping ahead on this because I've maybe already done this <laughs> uh, beforehand. So we're going to call this aggregate route, which is going to be our um, class as inventory. And then we're going to use the same one here. And for this aggregate route, we're going to call this order. So we're going to just jump ahead a little bit here and have commands in place. So events don't just come out of nowhere, generally. Something has to cause those events to happen. Um, so we're going to uh, create some commands. So order placed is going to be um, place order. And the idea here is that the order will be placed with a um, specific item and a quantity of that item. So that's what um, place order is going to be for receive stock or for stock received. The thing that we're actually going to do, the intent is going to be receive stock. And we are going to have sell stock. So where these things start to integrate is where is the connection between the order and selling the stock? so that the stock actually changes when you've ordered something. Um, so what we're going to do is create our first little process. And we're going to say, anytime an order is placed, we are going to perform an, an action that will be to sell stock. So this is how these two integrate now. We've, we've very explicitly connected the events from this system to the activity in the inventory. So this is sort of a case where uh, like item overdrawn, for example, or, or uh, account overdrawn before. This is that kind of event where it's meaningful to order because the order was placed but it's also going to be something that triggers something to happen in a completely different part of the application without them necessarily knowing about each other. Um, this little thing here is a discrete piece of the system now that controls how the orders are being decremented when, or how the inventory is being decremented when we sell stock. So I'm actually going to look at this and say, this is actually a little too simple, right? Because if you place an order, you don't immediately decrement the stock, right? Because the stock is actually still on the shelf. You haven't actually shipped it. So we are going to extend this a little bit more and say that we actually need to have something more on our order. We're going to have to have another set of steps to actually be a meaningful system. So we're going to do um, uh, order placed is going to probably not just go to inventory, but it's probably also going to be going to some billing systems and accounting systems and, and the like. Eventually, someone who's actually sending these orders is going to have everything in place Right, they're going to actually have gotten the thing off the shelf, uh, or the robot has gotten it off the shelf and confirmed it. And then we are going to consider the order fulfilled. And if you're in the business, and I'm using the wrong terminology, my bad. <laughs> yeah, if you do this sort of thing. Um, so let's do fulfill order. And then let's also spice things up a bit with order cancel order, which is the fun one, right? 
like you've already sold the thing and you've decremented the inventory, but now they've canceled the order. That's not exactly what you really want. So we do have to have some sort of support for canceling orders. And what does that impact the system, or how does that impact our system? So we're going to do order canceled. So we have a couple of other things now that we have to consider. We can't just sell stock now, right? Anytime the order is placed, we have to do something else. So these things can um, sort of evolve separately. But in this case, we're trying, we're, we're realizing that we have to do something a little more like thinking ahead and actually working together with the inventory team. So we're going to introduce a concept of putting inventory on hold. So we're going to do, oh, We're going to say that you can put inventory on hold. So we'll do um, hold stock. And then we'll do stock held. And then we'll do another event that's going to be release stock. And then we'll do stock release. So the, the idea here is that we're going to hold the stock if someone says we're going to buy it. It means we aren't going to try to sell it to someone else, probably. <laughs> I know that people oversell stuff all the time. But um, if, we, if the person in, uh, cancels the order, we're going to release the stock back so that it can be sold. If they actually fulfill the order, then we are going to actually, that's when we'll actually sell the stock. So now we're just going to have the only thing that we're going to have to change in terms of like the integration here. We've actually had to add a bunch of stuff on both sides. With the integration, instead of order placed, what should we do instead? Anyone have an idea? Which, which of these commands should we tell inventory to do? I got it. Yeah. Hold the stock, right? Yep. Yeah. So hold stock. So that would be on order placed. So now we need to know, what do we do on order fulfilled? What do we tell inventory at this point now? Uh, to sell the stock. Yep. And if we cancel the order, We're going to release it. Yeah. So you can kind of get an idea of how thinking about these things in terms of events and commands starts to make really complicated processes feel a little easier to understand and to be able to communicate them well. Now, there's all sorts of stuff that probably happened in this order. <laughs> um, you know, shopping cart and shipping addresses and all that nonsense, but we're not talking about that now. All of that stuff is important, but all of that stuff is really only important to order. So when we're talking about systems communicating with each other, the, the way that events and commands can integrate um, different concepts is kind of where event storming comes into play. You look at the big things that happen in the application that are important, and that's sort of the basis for your models. And then all of the other stuff that's important, you can still add. But in terms of how they interact with each other, this is pretty much uh, where event sourcing really, really shines, being able to communicate this stuff. Now, you could do the same thing without event sourcing, right? All this is are Normal events, like if you're using, say, Laravel, you could just dispatch an order placed event after you've done some update somewhere to the order, uh, the orders table. Um, you can create an event listener for order placed and then tell that to 
to look up the stock and then you know holds the increment holds uh, value by three and decrement something else or whatever you want to do. Um, so you don't have to do any of this with event sourcing. The nice thing is about event sourcing is that this represents exactly what's being persisted. So that this isn't just some high level thing that can get mucked up and actually that's not what really happens. This is going to be the, the only information stored about this order at this level will be the order was placed for this person, for this item, for this amount or this quantity, and then it was fulfilled on this date. And that's all there is. You don't have to like say, oh, well, what is the state of the order or whatever? It's, it's going to know what it is. It's going to um, just be based on these events. Does anyone have any questions about this stuff before I try to <laughs> do some coding? No? I, I, I don't. Okay, I kind of wanted to, but you go first, Colin. No, please, you. My question is kind of tangential. <laughs> I guess I'm probably overthinking this a little bit. So event sourcing, so I'm imagining just like a table in the database called like events or something. And you're just like logging all this stuff into like one single table. So would you not then have like an orders table that also has like the orders that were placed? Like, would you just store events and then kind of derive what your so, orders table would look like out of that, out of those events? Yeah. So that is where the projections come into play. The, the nice thing about these types of events is when you create the projectors, when you use the projectors to create read models, you can specify exactly what you want to be in the DB for um, like pending orders, for example. There could be a pending orders table that will be created when the order was placed. So that, or not the table won't be created, but that instance in, or the row in that table can be created um, as soon as the order is placed. And then as soon as the order is fulfilled or canceled, you can delete it from that table. And so you still end up with, you'll, you'll usually still end up with a lot of model tables doing things, but the source of truth, the information for how that data got there should be derived from playback of these events in various orders. And you do end up with one, well, there's a couple of ways you can do it, but the, the simple way to do it is to have one events table that keeps track of all of the events that have happened in the system, then create as many of these read models as you want. Okay, so I'm not replacing my, yeah, I'm, I'm not replacing my entire database with. No, you're not one events table. Okay. You're not replacing your entire database. And that's, that's one of the advantages of CQRS that's often touted is that you can decouple your um, write logic from your read logic so that you can optimize for whatever um, whatever is important to you. So on the, the event side, appending a new event to a read-only event log is really fast. So writes are really fast. Um, whatever you have to do to uh, massage the events into a read model, that may be slow, but you can write it into a database schema that is incredibly fast for reading. So even though transforming the data into that database might be kind of a slower process than you're used to, you can, you can create the data structure exactly as you want it to and not have to worry about um, what the reads will be. Um, one of the other advantages is to denormalize your schema because you no longer have to worry about something like the customer address needing to be in just one location in one table. You can actually just write out the customer's address into you know, a dozen different tables. And it's not like it, any one of them is authoritative. You no longer have to worry about, oh, well, I'm reading from here, but I should be reading from there. No, they all got it from the same spot and you're just reading it from there. So none of it's authoritative anymore, which can be, can be very useful and also very fast. Like if you actually get it written that way. The more interesting um, event source project I have is for a gaming system. 
where um, it's an iOS game that uh, reports player scores. And so they report the score once. I record the event once of what their score was, but it generates like, I think like four to eight separate tables worth of uh, scoreboards that are highly optimized to show like leaderboard type information. So that one score or that one play session that gets recorded is, is written everywhere so that um, whatever purpose they have, like one might be broken down by month, one might be broken down by year. Um, they also have a modified score for sort of like a calculated score, sort of like a handicap. Um, so that it takes into account like any cheats that you did or things like that. So it's, there's still only one place where that score lives authoritatively, but that score and all and a bunch of the other metadata live all over in other tables within the database. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So in the address example you gave, so an event would be fired like address change or something and then you yep. would have like a, uh, a projector on that that just knows like, oh, here's the 15 different spots and different tables I need to update the address. So it, all, it writes it out to all those? Yeah, that or else you would have 15 different projectors that know each one what it's going to write to. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so it, I guess we could probably also, I don't think I've ever seen it. Like we could also probably do something similar here with read models. So we could do say, order play, receive stock. So stock received, let's do um, a policy. Anytime stock is received, that will write to the read model that it will update the stock. It's kind, of, it's kind of harder to actually show those things, but that's kind of what's going on here that we may have a list of like visualizing what this list might look like or what this DB table might look like, it would probably be a uh, total number of stock available and then the total number of stock held so that we could get an idea of um, like when you're, when you're showing um, the items for people to be able to buy, you might want to show them that there's only two left for example, because there's a stock of five, but three people have them on hold. So you might wanna be able to say that there's two left. So depending on how you actually wanna do that, like designing what this read model looks like is kind of what you get to do when you need it, right? Like you might need a completely different read model somewhere else that's doing some sort of calculation to show you know, how often are we um, or how often are this, um, the amount of stock held is super high. And in other words, it's making the availability look super low so that we can't sell that to people anymore. Like we'd be able to create a report that shows that over time because we would be able to look at this information and the projector would be able to look at that and calculate what it actually wants to do. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Because we sort of looked at what we're gonna try and build um, so I fired up earlier today a brand new project for Laravel, and it's, uh, all right, cool. And so it's more or less just a stock Laravel application at this point. Um, I'm going to look at the docs to sort of show you how to find the things in the docs and also to copy and paste stuff uh, specifically for installation. So we're going to want to add event sauce to our application. We are going to do the testing because the testing stuff is actually really cool. Um, and then we are going to use the, I think we'll probably try to use the code generation. I've never done that before. Hopefully it won't take too much. Um, and I thought there was an illuminate Yeesh, if there's no illuminate package, hmm. I'll look at that later. If there's no illuminate package, this could be really interesting. Um, okay, so we'll do sale. Uh, 
Ah, I thought I did this already. Is ever given a name that you've always had? No, um, no, it's not. <laughs> I came. Up, I wanted to come up with a new name for a uh, custom um, vagrant project, um, and so I used ever given yeah. uh, because I thought, yeah, yep, Grant, it's the stuck, it's, uh, the stuck boat. Um, I thought I did sail up, so. Let's see if I can do it without doing sale, because maybe that'll work too. Sure, why not? Okay, so we installed the actual library. We're going to add the test utilities. And then we are going to add the code generation just so it's there. And I'll see if I can check this project in so that if it gets interesting at all, um, you all can use it. I'm not going to use the doctrine message repository because that's not what we want to do. So if you want to learn more high level stuff about event sourcing, you can actually look at, at what event sauce has to say about it. Um, there was something we talked about earlier. <laughs> Never mind. I think if I remember it later, I feel like there was something that came up earlier that I knew there was a page on specific, oh, database structure. Event sauce makes no real um, requirement on how you do any of this, right? That's their, their big selling point. Um, so as far as how the event store itself shows up in the database, there are a, different techniques you can use and there's pros and cons. So all events in one table is the one that I've always used. Um, and this is the one that event sauce uses as well. Um, you can also have, events per aggregate. So if we want to say we have the inventory aggregate and we have the order aggregate, we could actually create an event table for each of those. And so all of the events for orders go in the order table. All of the events for inventory go in the inventory event log. Um, and then you can go as far as table per identifier. Um, this would be inventory for the, the purple plush elephant for PHP has a UUID of whatever. There's now a table called that. <laughs> and all the events for that object or that aggregate are just in that table. Um, this is definitely something I've not done, but I know it's something that people talk about. Um, the biggest one is uh, like indexes. If you're using a SQL database behind the scenes, uh, the indexes aren't as much of a problem when you don't have to keep track of, say, the class name or the aggregate type or even the ID of the object um, in the event also. So yeah, so that came up a little bit earlier. Um, not exactly this specific thing, but this does talk about you know, the database structure and why it would be done one way versus another for the event, um, event store itself. Uh, architecture, oh. there are... Yes. I'm sorry. I was just thinking about that aggregate per identifier and like going all the way back to the bank account. Would that be a good example of that? Like events are pertaining to a single bank account? Um, it could. Yeah. I guess, I guess the thing is that the database structure, all of these database structures for the event store would work the same way. Like you would still do the same thing. Um, the, the reasons you would choose one versus another are kind of in the pros and cons, like the, like really the smallest indexes. Like if you have a bank that has some accounts that have been around since 1319 mm -hmm. and have millions upon millions of transactions just for one account, that might make sense that you would create, you would do this sort of structure um, just because otherwise you're never gonna get anything done because you've got trillions of rows in your database and that's never gonna be slow. Uh, or that's never going to be fast. Um, you know, the cons, things like maintenance is hard, migrating databases when you have an infinite number of uh, tables possible. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots of reasons why you would or would not do these things, but not 
for the purpose of um, we have one account, so let's just have or let's have it in it. Let's have each account in its own table, just because we want it that way. Okay. It's probably not the the best reason to make that choice. So that kind of goes back to what you were saying at the very beginning, where like they say, like implementation doesn't really matter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That, the the important thing is getting this right. Yeah. What happens under under the, the like how these are actually stored or whatever? Not as big of a deal. Cool. All right. So architecture uh, aggregate root repository is going to be the thing that controls inventory. So we're going to have an aggregate root repository for inventory, and we're going to have an aggregate root repository for order. Um, message repository is basically the event store. So this is where the messages live. So in the case of event sauce with all the defaults, this is going to be the thing that inserts and selects stuff into the um, event table in the database. So it doesn't know or care, or these implementations usually don't know or care what kind of object is in it. It just goes and gets it. And then message dispatcher is the part that says, OK, I've now placed an order. The order being placed needs to be persisted, but then also sent out so that it can be helped elsewhere. So the message dispatcher part is the part that emits it to the rest of the system. Um, and so they talk about how all of these items are replaceable. Um, you can replace the agg aggregate root repository. You can do something different for messages, dispatching, class name inflectors, what it uses to figure out the um, some of the names of things based on the class name. And then how do the messages get serialized? Like how are they actually stored in this event store deep or in the event store table? Um, and then payload serializers for how the events are, are serialized. So the events are wrapped in a message. So it's kind of like a higher level. So like the message repository contains metadata wrapping the actual event that happened. Core concepts, aggregate root. We talked about this a little bit. Um, this is this is the primary model. So this will be like the inventory instance is going to be our aggregate root. Uh, aggregate root repository is the thing that we can say, hey, go get the aggregate root for this ID. Um, talked about some of these. Uh, messages can be decorated. So anyone here familiar with the decorator pattern and decorating either HTTP requests or command buses or anything like that? OK. Yeah, so this could be, um, this is something that's actually pretty nice sometimes. Uh, it allows you to uh, add additional information. Like you could attach the, for like Laravel, since Laravel lets you get anything anywhere, um, you could attach the user ID of the person who caused this event to happen. So um, in the case of place order, that's probably going to be the user that logged in. But if it was actually, you know, the admin user, uh, we would actually be able to see that it was placed by the admin user. The order we know was actually for a the actual customer, but we'd be able to see that it wasn't the customer that placed the order. Um, and so that's not stuff that's a part of the model. Like we don't care about that at the, at the order level. The order doesn't care. Um, but it's something that we can add to enrich our data so that we can use that um, because we might need that later, right? We might have a view later that wants to show who did these things. Um, so, okay, so life cycle. Yeah, so this, this sort of talks about the nuts and bolts of how to actually work with these types of classes. So you ask the repository to retrieve the aggregate root, or retrieve the aggregate root for a specific ID. It's pretty similar to doctrine repositories if you've done that before, just there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes here. You can do more things on the aggregate root, but you have to actually persist them again on the aggregate root. It's not automatically going to make those changes. So perform action, perform another action. Inside perform action, 
what you do is you can guard your business rules so you can make sure that uh, the action that was requested is actually a legit action. It may not be. <laughs> you know, someone might, um, uh, if the other implementation of, say, the account balance thing, maybe we want to add a business rule that if there are premium, if the account has a premium flag on it, because we've added uh, that ability now, maybe the premium account doesn't get to go overdrawn. So we can actually say if premium and the command is going to, going to change the balance to be below zero, then we don't do it. We throw an exception instead. Um, so there's all sorts of things that you can do in here. And then the tricky part is all of these actions have a, that's the record the event that was supposed to have happened. So if we have place order as the method here, so place order, we would record that new order placed. So what this record does is register this new event that should be appended onto the events that were already persisted for this object. So record that new order placed, and then you could say for you know, a specific product for this quantity. Inside the object then, the, this is where the, I think I said the inflector comes into play. If I say some action was performed and I record it, the aggregate root itself will say, okay, I'm gonna pass that, that event to apply some action was performed. So this is how the state actually gets updated in these objects that you're dealing with. And the reason that this works is because, um, doesn't show it here, when you recreate the object, you aren't gonna do perform another action again. You aren't gonna do order placed again. But what's gonna happen is that behind the scenes, the repository is going to get all of the events for that aggregate ID and then play them back as if you had recorded them. So that is how this rebuilds the state every time you do the retrieve. So it's getting all of the events and then passing each one through to apply each of the events that was recorded. So it's a, it's a, all of the event sourcing projects that I've seen do this same sort of thing. So it's a pretty common um, way to do it, depending on, I, I guess it doesn't depend which, which library, you, library you're using, they're all going to have the same sort of thing where you do the thing inside it, you actually call record that this happened. And then that's where you actually make the change. Let's go right into here then. So we're going to create an aggregate root. Acne process. Okay, so let's pop into PHP Storm. By is JetBrains actually a sponsor? <laughs> I don't remember. It's definitely something you can yes. win. Yes, JetBrains is a, is a sponsor. Okay. So I'm going to create some stuff that doesn't normally exist. So I'm going to do app, no uh, domain, and let's do. Uh, we'll do in, uh, let's do order first because that's a simpler one. So we'll do order, and then inside order, I'm going to do things a little differently than what they do. But I'm going to say there's one part that I'm going to do differently than what they do. But we'll get to that in advance. We're going to do order. And we're going to use aggregate root behavior. It's one thing that I do like about event sauce is that it does a lot with traits rather than, um, oops, requiring you to extend everything. Uh, another pattern that is common with these PHP event sourcing projects is they use a lot with the static named constructors. So we have initiate and then initiate via import. Um, there's a couple of 
Hmm. Which is new, it's not a system new for it. I'm not gonna worry about that. So our first event was place. So we're gonna do, um, static function uh, place, and we're going to need an ID now. Oh. So Acme process ID, let's see where they define that. We're just gonna copy this. There's also a lot of wanting to make things be very explicit uh, in this world. So we're gonna do order ID. So you end up with a value object wrapping pretty much everything. So it's up to you with how much you actually want to <laughs> uh, fall into that. All right, so these are all gonna look the same. <laughs> so we're not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna do anything here. Um, you give it an ID, you can convert it to a string and you can convert it from a string to an object. So now we're gonna do place and we're gonna do order ID. And then we are going to instantiate the actual object. So we're gonna say new static. So we're gonna do instance. And then instance uh, record that. Um, then we need to have our first event. So we'll record that new um, order placed. So let's just do, yeah. And why is the constructor, why is, oh, why is that not working? The docs might be wrong. So we'll do new order placed. So now we need to create an event. So we're gonna do new order placed. Let's see what these are supposed to look like. All right, so we're gonna have to jump ahead to events. All right, so some event implements serializable play payload. So we are going to do this. Uh, return new static. All right, so this has property, which is not what we want. So we'll do order placed. Um, We don't have any data that goes with this. And so this is one of the things that Frank, the author of Event Sauce, tries to, he's doing something different than most of the other event sourcing implementations of PHP do. He doesn't put the aggregate root ID in the event itself. And that's something that's like backwards from everything else that, that I've worked with in the past. But I wanna to try to make that work <laughs> because if I can, that's actually pretty awesome. Um, so we're gonna do, um, now we can do new order placed because the consumer is going to know how to handle this um, because the consumer is going to have the whole message that has that will actually have the order ID as a part of the envelope. Uh, so it doesn't actually need to be in the event. All right, so now we're going to have to implement the record that um, process started. Hmm. Actually, I don't know if I need to implement anything here, order place for now. So we can jump ahead then and try to do uh, order fulfilled. So let's go ahead and do order placed. Let's do order fulfilled. And 
let's actually do, just to save a little bit of time, we're gonna do common We'll do um, empty event and what replaced. There we go. So now we can just create these somewhat easily. And so uh, Frank is also a fan of like composition and making sure that people can kind of do what they want to on their own. Um, so lets us do these sorts of things without requiring us to buy into everything that he's put together. So we'll do extends, empty event. So now creating any of our events that don't actually have anything. Um, so like if order fulfilled, um, we just need to do that. And then what was the other one? Order canceled. Now these things, even though there's a lot of code, as you start building into the system, you start seeing the things that you can, you know, distill down into um, common pieces. It starts to get a little, little easier. So order, we're now going to have public function uh, fulfill order. Now let's just do fulfill. Void, actually let's do that here too. No, I didn't finish this. <laughs> Not yet. Actually, no. I have to update my project to be eight for that to work. Uh, fulfill void, and then we're going to do um, record that new order placed. No, order fulfilled. And same thing for cancel. Canceled. And we don't really need to do this at this point. Um, well, we could probably. So let's do private state. Um, Let's create some constants here. So placed, fulfilled. And so the, the important thing to keep in mind here is this state doesn't matter because this is only going to be stuff that this object can know about. This isn't actually going to be like a state value that will be directly in a database table anywhere. We'll see how that works in just a minute. And then we'll do state uh, something like that. So what this actually means is that we do actually need to do something with placed now because there's nothing that's going to set what um, the state is. So we need to do uh, public function and see here. I think I had some helpers. Event. There we go. <laughs> All right, so this was, I, it's been a while since I've tried to use these. So uh, we'll do apply. And so 
didn't work the way I wanted it to, but that's okay. We'll do apply order placed. And we'll do this state. Uh, place. And then by uh, and then same thing for cancel. Okay, so what this means is that we now have some state that we can use for some guarding. We're gonna, I think we're gonna do some testing before we actually do that. So let's do test unit um, new, let's do And this is actually one of my favorite parts of any of these systems. Um, so let's do introduction, create a base test class for your aggregate. Okay, so we'll do uh, aggregate test case. Test case. And this is going to extend something from, so this was the test utilities that we imported earlier. So the um, event sauce provides these. And then we need to give these functions. So it's going to create a new aggregate root ID. This is going to be our order ID. We created earlier. And the aggregate root class name is going to be order. So this is the name of the class that we've been dealing with. Um, this is how we create the order ID. Apparently, this does not have create. So we need to add create here. Oops, that function. And we'll do, because we have Luminate support, we'll do order view UID to string. Uh, so we'll do return static. There we go. So now we have a create method that can be used in our order test case. So it's going to create an order ID. And then we go back to order test, uh, extends order test case. All right, and let's double check here. So handle. Yeah, okay, so this is actually doing This is assuming we have commands. Hmm. Don't really want to do all of that just yet. All right, so inside order test case. Wait, is it public? No. Okay, so 
what we're doing here now is bringing in the notion of commands. So, so far we've done events. So let's do a new class called command and we'll do uh, place order. And I'm guessing that there is a class for that. Events and commands. Hmm. All events must be objects. Hmm. All right, let's look for this one. So I think this will give us examples of what a class looks like. User subscribe, so that's an event. Uh, user unsubscribed. Subscribe to mailing lists. Okay, so yeah, it implements serializable payload, <clears throat> serializable payload as well. So empty event. Let's do um, and we'll do command. May have jumped the, the gun on this one. That will just have to be the way it is. Okay. So extends command. All right, cool. So now we have to implement from payload and to payload, uh, which means we need a constructor as well. So place order, actually, no. This wasn't bad because we, we're doing empty commands again. So we aren't. Need to look at their example. So for the testing. So the command is supposed to have the ID. So that was something that, let's do, let's rename this to empty command. And Okay. So if you've done any serialization, deserialization stuff, this should feel somewhat familiar. Um, we need to have a array implementation or array version of the payload of the command. And then we need to have a way to go from an array version back to the whole object. So just like we had empty events, we're going to have empty commands as well. Um, but they're not really empty because they have the ID in them. So um, they're slightly different than what we had before. Hey, Bo? Yeah? When I'm looking at the examples in on the site, Mm -hmm. One of the things about the commands that I'm not sure if you may have overlooked or not was in, in the two payload, we need to return like the elements as strings, at least. And then so your order ID there, I believe, is an order ID aggregate. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Yeah, that probably saved me a little bit of time. Thanks. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, so everything needs to be 
Oh, and that also means that I probably need to do order ID from string. Yep. Because the payload is going to be um, an ID. Yep. Let's see this parameter. Now. really too bad that they did this before they could lock it to PHP 8 because there's so much of this style of coding that is so much better when you can return static <laughs> instead of self. So I need to cast this as an order ID. Does that work? No. Or, so the, the problem here is that I have a order ID, but from string returns an aggregate root ID because that's what's expected by this, because this is returning self instead of static. Um, so It's just, it's really too bad because it makes this whole thing more complicated. So we want to be able to do that or aggregate root ID. I hate having to do this, but it cleans it up and makes it more clear. Um, okay, so now that we have our first command, so place order is going to extend empty command. We can go back to our test case. So if the command is an instance of place order, then what's going to happen is we are going to do aggregate equals this repository retrieve command. Okay, so I need to give empty command a order ID or aggregate root ID. So, so that's the one. Uh, it's actually going to be yeah. We should use the real one. This. Rename this to wow. You know what? All right, and uh, we'll do all this fun stuff. Because this is this is supposed to be a generic class, not one that's related to order ID anyway. So I guess all my whining earlier doesn't matter. <laughs> all right, so that means abstract. Okay, so that means that each type of thing so place order needs to return specifically an order ID. And I think I just have to ignore this for now. All right, so the test case. All right, so command get aggregate root ID. Um, actually, no, I don't get to do that. Um, because this isn't, there isn't going to be anything there yet. So we're going to do order place and get aggregate root ID. And then we are going to persist it. Let's see here, order test. All 
right, get places in order. All right, so now we need to give it an aggregate root ID. And so this is where we want, well, I guess it doesn't matter. So we'll do order create. And so what do we do with handle? Ah, so, all right, so we're gonna follow this actually. We do order ID root ID and this when so this is going to take advantage of our handle method. So when we place an order with the order ID, then we should see a event emitted that says uh, this when, why is that not working? Ah. Just case. All right, we're not going to worry about that. Then we should get a new order placed. So this should result in a order placed event happening. Uh, we need to bring it in. So it really takes away all of the pieces that we're used to seeing. So uh, we're still testing core functionality that when we place an order, an order is placed. So the test becomes very much exactly what we said it would be. Um, you know, we had to build a lot of stuff around it, of course. Um, but if, assuming this works, <laughs> see sale. Uh, I did a test earlier. Uh, So we'll do sale artisan test. All right. All right. So test, it places an order. Expected aggregate root to be an instance of aggregate root. OK, so. See what happens here. So there we get. All right, so persist. All right, so persisting it needs to be an aggregate root, um, which is exactly <laughs> what the thing said, but I didn't quite understand. So we are trying to call persist on an aggregate, and it's saying that order place is not returning an aggregate. So let's double check what order place. Uh, hmm. Oh, OK. So it looks like I missed a step. Create an aggregate root. Can't just use aggregate root behavior. It has to implement it as well. So the generic stuff that was set up for everything wasn't enough. All right, sweet. OK, so as far as um, event sauce is concerned, this works. So the next thing that we're going to do 
is deal with some preconditions. So we're going to do um, fulfill order next. So we'll do fulfill order as another command. So that's going to be similar to this. Um, so let's do order test. All right, so now what we're going to do is do it fulfills an order. And so this is a little different because we're not just doing straight up when, because we can't, because the thing should exist in the database, or it should be persisted somewhere. So we're going to do this given, and then this lets you do a bunch of events that have already happened. So let's do um, new place order. So given that we've already placed an order, when we um, oh wait no that should be order placed given new order placed because these should be events so this is saying if the object already has been placed when we fulfill an order now now we need to do the command I get D again when new uh, fulfill order order ID we should see then new order fulfilled. If this works out of the box, I'm going to be so happy. No, it did not. Um, that's the last commit events are not equal. Oh, so um, it's always good to see the test fail first <laughs> so you know that it doesn't just work willy nilly. We didn't do this part. So if command instance of placeholder, if command uh, instance of not placeholder but place order fulfill order then this is where we have to go in and do some stuff so we're going to do aggregate equals this repository retrieve command aggregate root id so this is we always get the aggregate root id from the command because it's that's the, the command has to know what it's trying to do once it's in the event land, it doesn't really care anymore because the object just knows that it's that aggregate root ID. Now we need to do the thing. So we're going to fulfill order. Um, we need to ful fulfill. And then we are going to persist our aggregate. So before we had done this, we were doing a command. Nothing was handling the command. So we weren't actually. Um, doing anything with it. So now it's actually doing it. So it's persisting it. So the thing that we can do now is uh, two more minutes. Let's see if I can do it. We're going to do fulfill order. We're going to do cancel order because then we can do some fun stuff. Cancel order. because we can do actual like guarding of logic. So cancel order. Um, and then order test case, we're gonna do instance of fulfill order and we'll do cancel. So if it's a cancel order request, then we should cancel, right? So if we just run this again, nothing should fail. Order test. So we're going to do um, it cancels. All right, so we do cancel order. New order canceled. Yay. Okay. Now the fun. We're going to write the test first. It cannot fulfill a canceled 
order because that just doesn't make sense. We shouldn't be able to do that. So given an order was placed and order canceled, when we fulfill an order, then we should not see anything happen. This should fail. Uh, events are not equal. Uh, yeah, they're not equal because we are getting an order fulfilled response. So we expected nothing, but we actually got order fulfilled. So this is where we can start seeing how the um, order can actually start guarding behavior. This is where we can look to see that state actually is doing something. So when we cancel an order, we can say if or no, where's cancel order? There we go. Uh, if this state, so we're only going to allow this if the state is placed. That's the, the good case. So we're going to say if not, then we're just going to return. So if it's not placed, that means that it's probably already been canceled or it's already been fulfilled. And so we're just going to ignore this message. And it still did it anyway. So state is not equal to. Oh. Hmm. I think you're thinking about the other. We want to be able to, you don't want to be able to fulfill a canceled order. So ah, would the guardian okay. the fulfill? Yeah, you're right. So the, the logic's actually going to be the same for both. But you're right. I think that's probably the wrong spot. Yep, there we go. So this, this is how you can sort of test that sort of logic. Um, the other thing you could do is probably throw an exception here. And then in PHP unit, like rather than just throwing away the message, if this is actually a error condition, <laughs> then you can you can still throw an exception if you want to. Um, but it's if it's already been persisted, it will replay this every time, right? Um, like if there's already, well, anything that's persisted will always be played through apply. So if you end up with two order fulfilled instances for some reason actually persisted, um, this will always run. But since we've blocked this from happening, it never records it. So this is, this is a case where you're blocking it from happening and not even bothering to record that you tried. Um, so that sometimes this makes sense to do this. Sometimes it makes sense to actually throw an exception here. Um, this really depends on what your um, use case is. But hopefully this gives you an idea of uh, conceptually how it works. Um, there's definitely some additional setup stuff for getting to actually work. Um, but in terms of, you know, we actually have an order that can be placed and canceled and fulfilled and you can't cancel an unfulfilled or canceled something that's already fulfilled or vice versa, whatever it was. It's doing all those things. We had to create a lot of classes for it. And that's one of the downsides of event sourcing and, CQ, and or CQRS is that you end up with a lot of moving pieces. but they're very small pieces that make a lot of sense, right? Order placed, it is what it is. Maybe it maybe it has a couple of um, properties on it, like which which item got ordered and the quantity, but it's very small. It's very easy to look at and understand what's going on with the code. And the testing can get really complicated sometimes, but the actual tests that you're looking at read just like the diagram. You know, there's, there is no step in the diagram where uh, you should, uh, where is it? There's no step in the diagram that shows that you can go from being placed to anything else, right? Or you have to be in place in order to go to these things. There is no diagram from order fulfilled to cancel order. So the tests definitely one of my favorite parts of these sorts of frameworks and this sort of architecture is that it's very clear what's going on. And then I'll stop. <laughs>
Thanks a lot, though. That was that was really great. I mean, I I was really you had me captivated the whole time. So uh, <laughs> thank you. Sure. Yeah. Thanks everybody for joining. I really appreciate it. Um, and for all the people who actually like chimed in and talked and stuff, that was really cool too. Appreciate it. There there was. Um, I know we are we are running long. There was just one kind of like observation that I made, and I was curious. Like this this reminds me a lot of like just object oriented programming in the sense of passing messages and things like that. And I was curious if if like the people that that kind of like came up with domain driven design, if they were object oriented programmers, or if they were, if they came from a variety of programming paradigms or, or whatnot. If you knew anything about that. I don't really know much about where they came from with that. I know that they are, they've been around for a while and um, they've seen things like, if you look at like Martin Fowler's stuff, like all these, none of these patterns are new. I mean, like this whole thing, like event sourcing, woo, right? Awesome, but it's, it's, a, it's what accounting has been doing. It's what's behind all the databases that we use every day anyway. Um, it's not really all that, different <laughs> it's not new um so yeah i think they just took years of experience and tried to look at patterns for how these things work best um try to give names to them like giving names to things that didn't have names before to make it easy to communicate about them and that's really what the domain driven design stuff is really all about is communication and being able to um, express what the code means as clearly as possible so that everybody involved understands. So like, you know, even, even down to the testing, you know, it cannot fulfill a canceled order, right? Anybody in the business, like you, we made it up, right? But if this were actually a business, anybody understands this. And, you know, anytime, you know, given an order was placed and then an order was canceled, when someone tries to fulfill the order, nothing happens. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's all, it's all about finding ways to communicate code and communicate ideas. That's, that's, that's the big thing. If there's a biggest takeaway for DDD stuff, it's look at it for the communication, like look at it again with an eye on like communication and how to work with people rather than the technical details. Like the technical details are fun, but really it's about communication. As I'm getting longer in my career, I'm finding that that's just the case for most things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I really enjoyed the event storming demonstration. I thought it was fantastic. Really enjoyed the presentation tonight. Thank you very much. Sure thing. Awesome. I can, um, I, I can see if I can get this checked in and we can send it out on Meetup or whatever and get the project checked in. And I can also see if I can get an invite to the Miro link so that everybody can take a look. Yeah, that would be awesome. Thank you. Cool.